Hey there, everyone. My name is uh, Jorvos, and I'm a passionate, I'm very passionate. Of, I'll start again. Yeah, hey good. Yeah. Hey there, everyone. Hey there, everyone. My name is Jorvos, and I'm very passionate about literature, philosophy, and history. And uh, l literature, philosophy, and history, I feel like all three of those things wind right into the thing the way I found you, I found you on an online website when I asked people, hey, I read a tiny excerpt of Thucydides, an ancient Greek historian, and I'm like, I want to talk to somebody who knows more about Thucydides. Just about anybody knows more about Thucydides than I do. And you like put your hand up and said, I'll talk about Thucydides. So I'm like, awesome. So how tell me. So your interests in history, philosophy and literature, how did you get into Thucydides, this ancient Greek historian. Why did you wind up reading him? Well, um, back when I started uh, with philosophy, yeah, um, I I started. And was with, it for fun? Was it for fun, or you had you do a degree, or did you take classes in philosophy? Okay. Um, well, the the idea is that uh, I would I wouldn't say it was for fun. But it was also not uh, classes, uh, nor something to do with the university. Um, and uh, I'm going to put it like this, like the idea that it is for fun. Uh, I would rather have a job that is fun and then spend my free time with something serious. And that's kind of like how I navig navigate life. And, Interesting. Uh, and um, and so in in this case, uh, what uh, started my curiosity about Thucydides was that uh, I was inspired by someone to uh, begin reading philosophy, and uh, at some point, I felt that uh, I should start from the beginning, and um, a good place that could be called a beginning is Plato. And he wrote extensively about uh, Socrates, like he had dialogue, he, he has dialogues where Socrates converses with other interlocutors. Um, and um, it's, Socrates is this interesting figure because he hasn't left anything written himself, but he has uh, a series of people talking about him. And uh, in one of these works by Plato, and uh, there's also a version by Xenophon, it's called The Apology, it's where Socrates is condemned. So after going through a bunch of these dialogues, I uh, built a curiosity to find out uh, what exactly the conditions were that led to uh, the condemnation or Socrates to death. Okay, let me ask, so even before we get to Thucydides, now I'm curious about the Socrates thing. I've heard that the, the version by Plato is different than the version by Xenophon, so there's we're not clear on exactly what happened, or the condemnation sounds like it was either for cor corrupting the youth or for, uh, what was like, her not heresy, what's apost... Saying something yeah. bad about the gods or atheism. So, oh. from your perspective, what, what are the th what are the things that you think are the arguments that you read that were like this is the reason he was killed? And you're like maybe. I mean, um, I I'm not familiar with the work by Xenophon. I'm just familiar with Plato's Apology, and in there, uh, both the reasons you uh, mention are listed. So it's both for. Uh, corrupting the youth and uh, for uh, not um, um, really uh, being pious to the gods of Athens. That's it. Impiety, right. Not being properly respectful of our gods. Yeah. And, um, and of course, right off the ballpark, when I was listening to lectures that had to do with the apology, uh, most lecturers said that um, both reasons were false accusations and that the actual reason was that they wanted a scapegoat for the failure at the Peloponnesian War. The politicians and the people of Athens wanted a scapegoat. 
but I'm, I'm not just satisfied with that. I, I, I wanted to kind of like uh, sketch it out for myself and even uh, try to be there as Socrates is being accused, like try to figure it out by myself. Understand and the interesting it. thing is Socrates lived contemporaneously during that during the war, so they can blame him. He participated in the war, so they want to blame him in some way. Well, the war was ongoing during Socrates' lifetime, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, like, uh, Socrates actually fought. And he was also part of different uh, democratic processes uh, where they voted for him to do a certain action, but uh, he refused to do it because he felt that it wasn't according to his values. Such a Socrates uh, thing to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it ties in a lot with uh, like uh, the main topic that I discovered through this, uh, let's say, personal research. And um, I'm actually going to give a short story um, so that uh, like everyone is on board with what I was trying to do. And... Um, I was at a friend's house and uh, I was going to stay there for a few days and uh, her upstairs neighbor, like at some point in the morning, he just started like pounding against something four times, like and at that point, when we heard that noise, we both started brainstorming about what that noise might be. Okay. And uh, it was an interesting dialogue because um, at first um, I was like, is, is he fixing uh, a bed? Does he have like a sofa bed and he's fixing it back and he has to press something into place? And like, well, why? Because this, this sound seems to be repetitive. Like it happens a few times a day. And she was like, well, actually, uh, a friend of mine who also lives in the same building told me that uh, he worked um, as, uh, and like, this is just like a random stranger, that uh, he operated sound systems in concerts. And so during COVID, he lost his job because he couldn't uh, earn money from uh, event organizing. Yeah. So um, maybe he's sending Amazon packages. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like the, the four punches, it's actually that uh, clip thing that he, he's like sealing packets. Okay. And for weeks, we were going on the assumption that the neighbor upstairs was an Amazon businessman. And then one day, <laughs> my friend uh, met, met the neighbor in the hallway and she thought, oh, it's now or never. I'm going to ask him. I'm going to tell him also that it's kind of annoying to hear that noise every morning. Right. <laughs> and he's like, well, actually, um, I have one of um, those big Italian coffee machines. And what you're hearing is me trying to clean the filter. <laughs> So he, he kind of unscrews the filter. It's okay. like one of, one of those Italian professional machines, like very expensive. So okay. it also means that whatever he's selling off Amazon is, uh, must be very good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, he's got money. He has yeah. a nice coffee machine. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And, and he just pounds it in that old traditional Italian way or whatever. I don't know. But he just pounds it away. <laughs> So he's like, what is he? Is he pounding the grounds out is what you're saying? Boom, yeah. boom, boom. Okay. All right. <laughs> and, and suddenly we had like reality changed. Like the, not reality itself, but the way we perceived it. Yes. And, and so it's one thing to take the word of, um, let's say, the government and the people of Athens who say that Socrates was um, this, uh, I don't know, like heretic and corrupter of the youth. Yes. It's 
uh, another thing to just take the conclusion of uh, a few professors, though I, I already assume from their authority as professors that they approach the truth. And it's another thing to go and uh, complete your own model of what happened. Because um, the difference between getting the, uh, the answer ready made for you and figuring out the answer by yourself is that you get a complete image of what happened, or at least as complete an image as you can get about something that happened 2,500 years ago. It's so much easier just to take the professor's word for it and move on. So I, I'm wondering about this particular thing. When you read about Socrates, read Plato's versions of what Socrates said, and you did, was it, Socrates you were most interested in? Was it all of a sudden, what is the part of this that like kind of you kind of grabbed onto and said, I actually want to do deeper research. I want to know the answer to this. Do you know why this thing grabbed you? Yes, it was because all the people that are involved in this period are considered to be somehow great even today. And I, I don't mean that in every mouth you get the name Pericles or the name Demosthenes. But when it comes to um, history in ancient Greece, and perhaps it's because of the Peloponnesian Wars, but there are other documents, etc. Like it's a much talked period. It's a period where many important, historically important people uh, come up and their accounts stay. And this doesn't mean that the rest of history is boring, but it just means that for a certain period of time, there were people who knew how to write and they took things down and there were personalities there that you could have a scenario of. Another period, which is very similar, is the period where uh, Caesar is, uh, Julius Caesar is, uh, dies. Because there you also get very prominent personalities with very detailed accounts. And um, you can see that, for example, Shakespeare, who did that play, and I don't want to go into that tangent, like he, were, he was also curious about what really happened. And he tried to give his best to give her edition of it. Yes. So it, it is something like an occupation that someone could undertake. And at that point, I decided uh, to undertake it. Okay, you decided I'm going to read Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. Yes. Uh, what? How did you go about this? So it sounds like you were reading, you were re not just reading about Socrates, but you were reading Plato's dialogues, and then you listened to lectures or listened to people write about that period. And then with Thucydides, did you approach it? I'm going to start from the beginning and work my way through. Did you read a book about Thucydides first? What did you do first? Okay. Um, the first thing I did was find uh, the nicest version of that book I could. I uh, researched uh, translators and um, I found a pretty good version. The second thing I did, and this is because I, let, let's say, much like everyone else, I assume I can only concentrate for so many minutes when reading something and then I kind of like veer off. So I, I thought that in order to maximize the reading and get the most out of it, I will get uh, a kind of accountability partner. And fa I found that I live in a big city. I found that that accountability partner in uh, a medical student who liked to read and was bored at, and at that time. And I just uh, told that person, hey, why don't we just read the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides? <laughs> okay, before I want to ask about that person, when you went looking for the best version, um, so Thucydides is written in ancient Greek. What did you look for the translation into? For instance, you are from Greece, but you currently do not live in Greece. So what language did you go to? And then that German student, did you share the same? We both want to read the translation in this language. Or was it? 
Well, um, I didn't want to read a, a modern Greek translation, and I, okay. uh, though I can understand to a certain measure and to a certain extent ancient Greek, mm -hmm. because we like all modern Greeks have to learn ancient Greek at school to a certain extent. Um, Is it just a little bit? Like in regular school, without going and getting a degree in post-secondary mm -hmm. university, is it just like one class or they kind of teach you all the way along? Or is it just like one little bit? Well, the, uh, that particular module, let's say, or class exists for uh, several years. Okay. And every time they try to get you a bit uh, deeper – but at the same time, it, it, it's not the kind of class where they will really fail you. So you really have to have some kind of interest to actually get onto something. The, what I don't like or I didn't like about that class was that it wasn't like we're going to be very dedicated about what we read and we're going to read it from start to end and we'll actually learn something out of it. It was more like a, a pick and mix. Like we start with Homer. We go from the Iliad to the Odyssey, just a few, like just one rhapsody from each. Then we read a bit of Plato. Then we read a bit of Xenophon. Then we read a bit of uh, Aristotle. Then they just uh, throw a few cliches at us, like uh, know thyself. <laughs> and, 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 and then you go through the, the test and uh, you hope to pass. Okay. But they're really just, they're not looking for you to absorb. It didn't sound like they were trying to ask you to absorb intellectually the material. They wanted you just to have some facility. And if you wanted to read ancient Greek sometime in the future, you would have enough of a grounding. You could have a start to that. But they weren't trying to teach you. We're going to teach you all about the world of ancient mm -hmm. Greece. And we want you to understand all the philosophy. You're like, no, no, we're just trying to teach you the language. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That, that's pretty fair. They, they want to give everyone a starting point. Okay. And they wanted to get everyone interested. That's very fair. And does it feel like it, uh, in Greece, do you, does it feel good? Like this is a part, you talked about this as a powerful moment where the whole world keeps looking. It's been thousands of years and the whole world keeps looking at this, at this ancient, this area of Greece at this time. Is it like a sense of pride? Like we're we're proud. This is our heritage, our civilization way back when. I mean, I would say that generally, culturally speaking, there are people who have a sense of pride for that. And uh, usually people are, um, let's say, motivated to have that pride. And I mean, why not? But... Uh, Personally, I, I, I try to, um, to have a, a more, um, let's say, I try to have a different perspective. I, I want to examine it and learn from it. And um, I mean, I don't want to be proud about something that's outside my control. But if there is this Greek fire inside of me, let it show in my own life. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll be proud about that. Okay, that's fair. Okay, so I completely derailed you to ask yeah. about. So you're like, you are you were not going to read it in the ancient. You didn't want to read it in a modern Greek translation. So what did you choose? English. Okay, you chose English. All right. Yeah, and um, at the end, at the end of the day, it was a, a translation that happened uh, as we <laughs> like uh, talked about it before um, in a time when. Um, the, the British had a lot of money to give to such uh, literary and archaeological and historical expeditions. And, uh, and, and so you could find individuals, and I'm not denying that you can find them today, but back then you could find many individuals who were very well versed in ancient Greek, and they, and they could devote such and such an amount of time to getting a pretty good translation out. Okay. Um, now, given, so you're talking about a translation that was done, are you talking about like a late 1800s translation? Like, do you know what period it was oh, from? It, the one I, you I, can, I can just say the name. It was like uh, Benjamin Joe Wett. Okay, yeah. That's the, that's the little 
excerpts I read were, f- and it was really good. People said Thucydides was just very difficult to read in the ancient Greek, but that jo- that Benjamin Jowett translation was fantastic that I read. So of course there are many critics of him, okay. and there is of course his personal bias in the writing. But generally speaking, if I'm not going to look at any every little detail, and I want to uh, get, let's say, so much of a definition. Like, I don't want to get a very pixelated picture. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to get a very high definition picture of every little detail. I want to be somewhere in the middle where I understand what I'm reading and I can make my own judgments, etc. If in the future I'm, uh, I'm more interested to get more in-depth with it, then I will pursue uh, more sophisticated translations. But I think that Benjamin Jovet is fair and he's sophisticated enough. So, And during the entire reading of it with your partner, were you did you always kind of maintain a focus on, I'm really trying to answer the question, if Socrates was unjustly scapegoated, if this is true, if there's evidence inside Thucydides for that? Or did you wind up going down all kinds of weird rabbit trails and tangents during your reading? Oh, um, I mean, like uh, the, the question I was asking was what were the circumstances which led to this occurrence and how everything was staged and who were the actors? Because there was like a very delicate story path of a certain uh, young politician called Alkiviadis. But at the same time, I was also curious about uh, what Thucydides had to say. So in, in the end, I, I, we just took a lot of time to go through it. We went through it um, slowly. But at the same time, um, as the book progressed, we progressively also became more and more interested in the different storylines that we're developing. Yeah. And so to also just like an, an ultra summary, uh, Athens and Sparta are city states that are, we would say they're near each other. Maybe in the ancient world, they felt far away. They had come together a couple of times in one way or another in to fight an outside force, the Persians. And now the Peloponnesian, this history of the Peloponnesian war is now Athens and Sparta not really brothers, it's not really a civil war because they are very separate nation states, but now they're in conflict. So the Peloponnesian, this whole thing is really about how Athens and Sparta are vying for control in some way. Mm-hmm. Is that fair? Is that what, it, okay. So you go, okay, so it's, you you kind of go through it very slowly. What what was it like to read it? What kind of things, I don't know, what kind of things popped up when you were working your way through it? Um. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to say is that uh, I'm going to prefer city states. Okay. Uh, because that's uh, fair. I did call it nation states. Yeah. This was well before nationalism. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Um. Now, uh, could you, could you please repeat your question? Oh yeah. So I'm just wondering. Okay. So you have your partner. Mm-hmm. You've got your translation, and you're going to work your way through slowly. So what was that? What was that slow working through it like? How long did it take you? What was it like? Oh, well, it actually took us two months. Only two months? That's pretty dedicated. You're like, we worked through it slowly. I mean, it's not an extremely long book, but it's pretty long. So that was pretty dedicated. Yeah, it was pretty dedicated because at some point we figured out that what we were reading was a prototypic novel and we were hooked with the (laughs) storyline. And I, I think that uh, it would be valuable to mention here that uh, there's like character storylines on two levels. And so on the first level, you have, um, let's say, the different city states. And each city state like uh, starts gathering like for it a profile because there are all this information coming in. There are people who represent these city-states like Corinth or Corsira or the Platea, et cetera, or Sparta or Athens, and they talk for these city-states. 
And in each speech, you kind of get what kind of uh, strategy this city state is following, what kind of affiliations they have, and uh, what they are trying to achieve with their strategy. And, and so the city states themselves are, let's say, characters. And um, one of the most uh, prominent speeches in the whole book is the funerary um, speech of Pericles. And um, the thing that this speech does is pretty much give us a, a description of, let's say, the soul of Athens, in quotation marks. Uh, now, who says this? Is this this uh, Pericles has died, and now someone is delivering a speech at Pericles' funeral? It's Pericles himself, and uh, I believe that he's talking about uh, past Athenian warriors. Okay. And in it, he he just captures this Athenian spirit, and and then there are some differences about these uh, city-state characters. And the market difference of uh, the city-state characters is that, for example, in Sparta, obviously, people have names. But unlike Athens, they're always dealt as the Spartans because they are one force. They, they are, uh, um, Thucydides gives us like a very entertaining descriptions of uh, the Spartans taking decisions together. And <laughs> it was during uh, an almost daily uh, ritual called the uh, Sicidia. And there the Spartans sit in uh, their respective tables that we're just talking about the citizens, warriors, Spartans, who have completed their training, they are over a certain threshold of age, they fulfill a bunch of criteria, and they get to decide, and they're all there, and basically, they're rowdy warriors, all they do is shout. And, and the names or opinions that are shouted out the loudest are the ones that are taken. Okay. And there, there was, uh, in the beginning of it all, there was like one cautious king. They had two kings because they didn't really want to have some kind of totalitarian state, let's say. They wanted all to be knights who on a round table who decide yeah. what's going to happen. Uh, and the king says like, um, well, actually, I, I, I don't think we should motion towards uh, a conflict. And every, everyone starts shouting, like, how, did he castrate himself? What's wrong with him? <laughs> We're able warriors. We can, we can weather through this. Uh, and um, on the contrary, on the other hand, you have the Athenians, and they are more about personalities. It's still like, let's say it's even reminiscent of the, um, of Homer's work, though Homer lived like um, a long time before what happened in the Peloponnesian War. And you have like, uh, you have, of course, the people of Athens who are the, the important ones, let's say, because they make decisions. But actually what you have in that landscape is that there are certain um, personalities who uh, stand at the top of their own clique and they deal with the uh, politics of Athens because each but when they deal with the uh, politics of Athens like each one of these people of these persons has a name and they are mentioned by name in the Peloponnesian Wars Peloponnesian War. And uh, one of them, for example, is um, Nicias or Nicias, a general. Another is uh, Demosthenes. Another is Alcibiades, or some uh, in, uh, in English uh, trans, uh, like uh, pronounce him as Alcibiades. 
mm-hmm. among others. And, and so we, we even on the political level, the, the politics of each city state define its representation in uh, this uh, historical piece. And at the same time, these uh, people who have a name like uh, Nicias or Alcibiades, they interact with each other and you can see the interactions. But when it comes to the Spartans, you don't see like uh, interactions between highly priced individuals. You you just see a mass of, of soldiers coming at you. Uh, it reminds so the one speech they offer there's um in the excerpts i read there's athens getting there athens gathering its fleet and then it's athens fleet getting beaten and them be, get, getting chased away and they're losing their fleet but before that they have a scene where i think the representative from corinth comes and says hey spartan you've been sitting around on your hands and not doing anything these Athenians, uh, they take all the land they can. They're unstoppable. They keep marching. Con- they're constantly going out and trying to grab more stuff and do more stuff. And you Spartans kind of wait for the war to start. Well, you guys need to go to battle. And eventually they do talk them into going to battle. But it's interesting because the thing you mentioned, the Spartans, the representative for Corinth comes up and the, the Athenians come up and speak. And Sparta's just like the Spartans. And then the Spartans decide this or the Spartans decide that, but there's no speech from the Spartans in there. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, there, there are just lots of uh, rowdy calls. And <laughs> okay, ju- just to add another anecdote, of course, yes. the Spartans, they had a reputation about themselves. And a piece of that reputation was that when the Spartans were sent to war, their mothers told them, Either you come back with your shield or on your shield. That means dead. Right. But then there's like a little scaffold where the Spartans are trying to hold an island. And uh, the Athenians beat them. They give them no escape. And the Spartans just surrender. And the Athenian messenger goes to them and like, I thought you were Spartans. Like, what, what, what's going on? And um, don't quote me on this, but the Spartan uh, response is kind of like, oh, come on now. Okay, there, see, these people died. We can honor them. But like, let's just sign the papers and let me go home. <laughs> oh, so I have a question. Is that sort of pro-Athenian slander? So is that a bent that the Spartans... From when you read the entire book, did you have a feeling that Thucydides had a very clear one-sided bias towards Athens or Sparta? Um, one could say that, but in in my opinion, I I think that uh, when he was writing it, he was being critical of Athens. Okay. So I I think he wants to give a fair representation. And, and this leads me to another point. And the point is that, you know, um, and I was thinking about this yesterday. I was talking about this yesterday with a friend. It's something like uh, we were reading it in a lecture, actually. It was like in, nowadays we have, uh, we are very fortunate, at least in our countries, to have what we call um, security, a sense of security. Yes. That uh, we like um, we can do many things in our daily lives without getting into, let's say, mortal danger. Right. Um, back then, like in those times, they didn't have this security. And even when they mention that uh, they feel assured in doing this action or not. They, they are talking about the calculation they made according to the contingencies of what happened uh, around that um, area. So for them, as people, it was very important for them to be fair, 
to maintain a good reputation and to have honor in their dealings. That is like the word of the individual meant more because they absolutely uh, had to hold themselves accountable to the community in order to maintain at least a sense of security for themselves. And this was not even always the case. They, within their in-group, they, they felt they had a, a calling to be more accountable. And um, this especially is uh, found in what the ancient Greeks called the virtue of uh, temperance or sophrosyne. Of course, it spreads out onto all sorts of um, uh, things like um, their personal life, how they took care of themselves, what they ate, uh, how they behaved in public, how they spent money. They, it, it kind of had like this multiplicity of sorts, like sophrosyne, which just means having a sound mind. But a great part of this was engaging in sound dealings. So, um, and I don't, I don't want to say something bad against marketing or people who like to market things, but marketing in uh, ancient Greece can only take you so far. And the personality uh, who kind of, kind of, only to a certain extent, represents that is on one hand, Cleon, who is one of the generals and he's the most bombastic about Athens going out of their way to expand and extend their outreach. And yes. also at the same time, Alcibiades, who, is, uh, who also pursues this, but he's more cautious than Cleon. So yeah, that, that was my point. Is there, let me, that I, so I think that's interesting. Um, I've done a, I've done a lot of reading of the primary and secondary stuff of ancient stoicism. And it's interesting. Stoicism is focuses very much on deciding which things are part of your own internal future virtue and your public duty. There are certain duties you have as a father, a son, a sister, a daughter, a citizen of your city state, um, a warrior, that's your virtue. And then all these other things are the indifference. These are things we don't care about. I don't care what you think about me. I don't care whether I only try to act virtuously. Mm -hmm. It sounds like this virtue you're talking about, temp is it is the best translation temperance? The I, I would even go so far as to just maintain the word sophrosyne or sophrosyne okay. or however it would be pronounced in English. But uh, temperance is one... Uh, translation that was preferred at a certain uh, time and moderation is another. Is it an alignment of, so you're talking about very basic things, how you exercise, how you eat, things you do out of the public eye, or is it can, um, what I, I guess what I'm trying to get as is the virtue you were talking about or this, uh, this attempt to do this, it sounded like it had a very public thing. It's your reputation, it's mm -hmm. your name. But also, it's also very personal things, the kind of way you conduct yourself all the time. Did it feel like they were trying to have a, a kind of life or character that the things you do alone for yourself, for virtue, align perfectly with exactly as you act when you are in public? So you do the same thing with one person <clears throat> as you do with 10,000. And there's no there's no marketing. I'm not marketing. I'm this way with 10,000, and I'm this way with one. This is who I am. Is that – does it – is that the trust you're talking about? People know who you are and what you will do? Yeah, like uh, you have a name. And, and now you, you mentioned stoicism, of course. And now I have to make this uh, disambiguation. And <laughs> the, the, the thing is that when an ancient Greek at that particular time was talking about temperance, like we have to think that uh, le le let's create two concepts. So I'm go just going to keep them vague to a certain extent. And one concept, concept is like strength, like inner strength. And the other concept is power, like how much power you wield in the social um, circles. 
And um, what stoicism, stoicism does, and I don't mind if people disagree, is focus on strength. Correct. That makes sense. Yes, very much. But in the conception, and they do have a virtue which is so Frosini as well, but it also, I feel, focuses on this strength, let's say strength of character. But at the same time, the ancient Greeks, when they said Sophrosyne, they also meant with regards to power. And this means that um, in a small city state or in a small city or in a small state, however we may want to say it, uh, the ruler or the person who is given the power, if he reaches for all the apples on the table, <laughs> okay, the people who also need to eat from that table, they like they will just kick him out. There's, there's no magical reason why he's there. He's there on the guarantee that everyone will get their slice of apple. Okay. So a leader who has Sofrosini, who is temperate, let's say, mm -hmm. will reach for much of the apples there because he's the leader, but he will leave apples there for everyone else. As well. That makes so. I I love your distinction in Stoicism because I completely agree with you. And everything I've read about Stoicism, it sounds like they completely cut off that other side. That power part is indifferent to that. Doesn't ma you have responsibilities? If you are put in a position of power, you have responsibilities in those moments to do things, but you're not concerned with it. Whereas it sounds like this is a much more holistic, a much more whole-bodied virtue where you're concerned not just with the public but with the private and both. So I feel like Stoicism just cuts that off and says, that's not important. Don't focus on that. You can't do anything about that. Um, along those lines where we're thinking about leaders, so as, as you came to the end, so after two months, you ripped through this book, <clears throat> you discovered all these characters, you discovered the characters and personalities of these city-states, uh, you followed this novel-like narrative through the story, and of course, the story does abruptly end. So the war, does, I mean, Thucydides dies before the war is over. So the, the novel doesn't get fully resolved because you'd want to see the end of the war. Um, did you find what you were looking for when it came to trying to figure out what was the situation that Socrates was born into and living in at that time and might have affected his scapegoating or might have got him in trouble? Did you did you get any anything out of that? Well, there, there are a few points that drew my attention in particular. Okay. And um, the one point which uh, I felt was one of the two important points that happened in the book was um, the deal with the millions. And uh, this is, I think, the most uh, famous part of the book and I think that in the consciousness or like in the understanding of many people about Thucydides and the Peloponnesian War, they always want to uh, mention the Melian dialogue. Which that is the, you're right, that's, it wasn't the excerpt, but that's the most famous one. So why, in your perspective, why is that so famous? Why, was, why is it so important? Why do people cling to that? Uh, because it, it is just a... Uh, a big demonstration of uh, power and uh, what, what power, uh, how power decides. Because, I, uh, because uh, it, it basically, how was it? I even had the quote in my mind. Uh, the, the powerful do what they want or need and uh, uh, weak suffer what they must. And then, you, you know, like this is basically, it's a political decision to just uh, exterminate the colony. 
Well, can I ask just for those, because I'm not familiar, what is what's happening in the narrative at that time that this whatever this this discussion that happens, what is happening at that time? Well, uh, I, I mean, basically, the narrative that's happening at that time is that uh, as the two uh, main competitors, Athens and Sparta, uh, start yes. clashing, they have to secure allies and make sure that potential points of threat and potential people who would turn to the Spartans or the Athenians for the other side are uh, cut off. And, okay. and, and this includes expeditions to many uh, little islands and uh, slaughtering of many people who had colony, who were living in colonies in these islands. Um, it also includes negotiating with uh, external powers like Persia and uh, even some kind of minor expedition to Egypt, wow. which the Athenians took and it failed. I don't know why they did it. Probably another one of their flexes. Uh, uh, <laughs> like, then, watch us. We're uh, so big, we can send people to Egypt as we prep for war. And 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 then involve the involvement of uh, Macedonia and uh, Thrace as well. And with regards to, let's say, like you go to the level of Macedonia, there you have a kingdom, which is something different than the city states. And then you go to the level of Thrace, where you basically have uh, mercenaries uh, who are just going to fight for the money. And what happens there is that the Athenians just wanted to make sure that uh, the Millions didn't uh, turn to Sparta at some point from their neutral standpoint. And the Millions were like, no, no, we, we'll stay neutral. And the Athenians were like, uh, I'm not going to stay around and figure that out. I have the power right now to exterminate you, so bye-bye. And, and then, like, uh, the catchphrase stays, the weak suffer what they must. Yeah. And, and then, like, oh, power politics, like, power, yes, that's how you control the world. But then, of course, like, this is just part of the narrative. It's like right. the, the reason why Thucydides put it there, like, at, at that, let's say, um, central highlight, highlighting place is that because later the Athenians themselves end up in a situation where they suffer what they must. <laughs> is that, is the suffering what they must, is that the scene when the fleet is destroyed and they're pushed out and they wind up in the pits like way at the end or no? Yeah, it, it's the scene where they went, wind up in the pits and the mines and they have to basically just die there. Uh, and then, uh, like, just a few of them escaped to tell the story in, in Sicily. And, uh, and, and that's where the, let's say, the characters of Athens become crucial. And um, on one hand, like, there's, there's Al Alcibiades, and, and he's, like, pushing for it. And that was the point I wanted to mention that was very critical yeah for the story with Socrates. He's like pushing for it. He wants, he wants to go to the Sicilian expedition. At the same time, his uh, political enemies are trying to implicate him to some sacrilege that has happened uh, in, uh, on the sculpture of Hermes in Athens, which would construe a bad omen. So basically okay. there, there was supposedly a symposium, a party, some people got drunk, and they implicated Alcibiades that he was also also got drunk and went around and uh, vandalized uh, the statues of uh, Hermes. Okay. And um, Alcibiades is there. He's like he's like a very proud soul, very but not proud in the negative way we think today. He's very accurate about the things he has achieved, and he's very young and he's hungry for more. He wants one day to, um, let's say, command. He wants more command. He can do it. And yeah. he, he, he's a go-getter, let's say. And then uh, there are these people, and uh, they're, they're like trying to find different ways to undermine him. And they may make up this whole thing. And I mean, obviously, it's still open whether he did it or not. 
But let's say right. like there are people who are actively trying to undermine him. And, um, and he's there. He's like, I'm going to do something great for us. I'm going to win you this. And then there's another part, and that's um, Nikias. And, and he is, let's say, uh, a very honorable person. He's not the one who is trying to frame Alcibiades, but he's, he just wants the war to come to an end. Yeah. And he, he's like, we have what we want. We have this power. We, we can be the winners of this war tomorrow, and we can sit on our laurels and, and uh, like just expand in different ways. Right. But no, because like um, the Athenians themselves, the people of Athens, they have tasted power themselves. They have tasted success, and they're hungry for more. They have like this uh, greed for more. And the more is not that actually they all want to become um, rich or something, though that could have happened. It's more that when they first had their successes, they felt this elation. It was kind of like sniffing cocaine or something. (laughs) And now... They want more of that. They want another hit. And there they are in full pomposity. Like they have the fleet that you mentioned before. And they're adorning it with all these, um, let's say, um, colors and statues and carvings and flowers. And they're chanting in the streets. And they're like, we're going to go there and we're going to kick ass (laughs) who are these sicilians what do they want from a like here 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 i come (laughs) and then and then uh they're, they're just pumping each other up and this is what the ancient uh greeks in all their tragedies called hubris yeah and this is uh exactly what thucydides was trying to portray, okay, so you have that power, you exercise it on the millions, let's say, you get a, a taste, then you have a few more victories, you say, you have, a, uh, you feel secure in your position, and it's right. exactly at that moment, when you feel most secure in your position, that you're going to make your mistake. And that is, in fact, what happens. They do have the most powerful fleet, and they, they sail their navy to Sicily, and they lose. Bad. Yeah. Yes. And so that example you gave of how do you pronounce out? I, I have heard Alcibiades, but how would you pronounce it? I mean, I would say Alcibiades, but I, I would have said Alcibiades. I mean, I'm sure that in other languages they call it differently. So it's interesting that that leader gets called kind of called out for hub- hubris of the people, but then he- his hubris. I mean, he's justified in saying I'm a great military leader so far. It goes badly. I don't so I just I'm desperate to track it back to Socrates. Socrates is super annoying but is also incredibly humble. So this the, somebody stages um an argument that this general or this leader is being impious to the gods and and then somebody on the other side, they do that to Socrates, but it seems Socrates doesn't sound in what we've doesn't sound anything like this general. Yeah, well, well, we have to look at this general a bit more and not in okay. comparison to Socrates, but in his own right, because uh, what happens is that uh, they when he's still in Athens and he's like trying to clear his name. Yes. And it's like, let's have. A judge and jury now. And if I am found on the wrong on this, kill me, execute me. And they're like, no, 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 no. He gets on the ship, he starts sailing towards Sicily as he's on his way to Sicily because most of his clique who would vote for him are with him, they are all soldiers. Yes. They, char- they press charges. Yeah, he took his political party with him and left the other political party behind. <laughs> yeah. 
And I mean, he's traveling with uh, Nicias or Nicias, who is the, the other general who didn't want to go to fight. But Nick is like this fair person. He's like, okay, they took this decision. I am part of Athens. I will represent Athens the most, the best I can. And he, even though the, it's like this, uh, all these atrocious things happen, and he ends up dying in Sicily, he he still maintains, let, let's say that old-fashioned ancient Greek honor. And he he takes it to the end. He like he he spent so much time trying to. Um, we, like try to let's say uh, negotiate for Athens as they are losing. At, at first they were winning; they had, didn't have a problem. Even when um, Al- Al- Alcibiades, Alcibiades himself, he had fled because he was kind of like you know. And, and this is the interesting thing: like he he just goes like, you know what? I'm trying to make a big win for these guys, and they're trying to double cross me. So you know what? Like he he uh, he makes a, a mistake. He reacts. And uh, his mistake is that he goes over to the Spartans. And like the Spartans are like, oh, yeah, come over. They learn all the secrets they want from him. He helps them stage a successful expedition against Athens because he knows all this. Like, well, you didn't know this before, but if you hit that place, if you hold that fortress, if you uh, punish these people, you will also hurt the Athenians a great deal. They're like, okay, thank you, thank you, taking notes, taking notes. And then they do all these things. And then at some point they're like, you know what, Archibald is like, you're not a Spartan. Bye. And then, and then, and then he has to go uh, somewhere else. And all the time, all the time, he's trying to get his revenge. He's trying to get his revenge on the Athenians. And at some point he ends up in the Persian court. And they're like, you know, in the beginning, he's dealing with the Athenians and he's telling his achievements and everyone is taking him like seriously. And, and uh, they uh, issue this expedition. Even though he has political enemies, they still take him seriously. They, they still follow what he says. They still hang on to his words. But there's a point where he is like with a... Uh, in the Persia, in front of the Persian king, and they're like, yeah, he's that guy. He's full of bullshit. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to keep dragging you t- to Socrates. This You're not making this leader sounds terrible. You're just making him sound more terrible. He's way more terrible than Socrates. So at the end of the day, when you got done with this, what was your assessment of those professors that you'd listened to months before who said it wasn't about the impiety? They were mad about Socrates. They were mad about Socrates' conduct during the war, and he's being punished for that. Well, at the end of the day, I I, I agreed with the professor. Oh, you did? Okay, you're like, yeah, at the end? Like, like, at okay, the end, it, it's basically that the politicians and the people of Athens carried with them a great weight, a great resentment about everything that happened. And they needed a scapegoat. And Socrates had connections with Alcibiades. He even tried to teach him some things. They had dialogues together. It's purported that Alcibiades tried, like in the symposium, that Alcibiades tried to have have a sexual relationship with Socrates. But Socrates wasn't, wasn't dealing with that kind of thing. Uh, who knows? Uh, but at the end of the day, they just found someone to scapegoat, and the idea was that he, like Socrates, was just going to um, say yes, sorry. But he, like, with regards to the accusations that he received, he stuck to his guns and he and he, and, and and he went to the end with it, and that was right his decision and it was what he represented and what he represents, like what Socrates represented and also what Nicky has represented and uh, what Thucydides tries, tried to bring forward was that, you know, there's power, but if you want to have power, you also have to have strength of soul to wield it. 
if if this you know and and this doesn't ratify for me the stoics because the stoics are like you just need to have strength of soul like no Correct. it's kind of like there is power and there's strength of soul and they have to come together and if you don't have them together then you end up like Alcibiades, you end up like Athens. And the Spartans, they were moderate, and they won because of their moderation. They weren't going around in Egypt and Persia and, um, and Sicily and uh, trying to, prepare to expand the borders. They didn't have like people going around, yeah, well, why, why don't we discover? Like, they, they knew that what they had as atrocious as it might seem to us today when we look at the particulars of Sparta and the Helots, etc., was working for them, and they stayed there. And that, that's the value that Thucydides, I feel, was trying to demonstrate. And uh, just to re-answer your question with Socrates, yeah. it's what the professor said. It's that the people of Athens needed to blame someone and Socrates was like fit for blaming. But now, even though, let's say, the answer I came to personally right. corresponds to the answer of the professors, maybe it's not as detailed as a very high profile professor would I have uh, constructed, let's say, in my brain through the study, but it's more detailed than just a sound bite from a lecture. After Thucydides, did you continue on to now I'm going to read uh, more. So I'm going to go read Herodotus. I'm going to I'll go dig into Plutarch. I'm going to go look at Xenophon. Uh, did you or did you move to something different after this is my this was my ancient time and I'm going to take a break and move into something more contemporary or something in another region. Where did your reading take you after Thucydides? Well, there, there are other writers who deal with this and I chose Aristophanes. Are you now with Thucydides, you read the thing from start to finish. Are yeah. you like, I'm going to read every single play by Aristophanes? Uh, yeah, every single safe play. And, okay. <laughs> and, and there, were, there were lectures with that. And I mean, uh, if people want to know who, whose lectures I was listening or reading, it's uh, Leo Strauss, who was uh, a significant political scholar at his time in the University of Chicago. He also has a lot of critics. But uh, you know what? If someone in the audience knows someone who, is, uh, who has better lectures on these topics, please contact me and send them to me and I will read them. Right. You're like, I do want to read them, but, you know, it would be hard to beat Leo Strauss is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and yeah, with Aristophanes, you also have exactly the same characters. You have Socrates in one play. You have Nikias in another play. There's like a, a play called the Aharnians, uh, which is very funny. Nikias doesn't take part in it, but there's another general who took part in the Sicilian expedition called Lamacus. And you get kind of insights about what the people thought about these people. And like he's like this rowdy guy who is uh, poor, but very, very proud. And by poor, I mean poor for the standards of a general. And, right. and, and, and he goes to the protagonist of the Aharnians and he's like, uh, oh, uh, like, because uh, the, the story is that the Aharnians are like kind of like in the um, suburbs of uh, the city state of Athens. And, and they're, like, they're like rural people. And uh, they, they kind of um, rely on trade for their survival. And he's like, ah. Uh, you know what, during this Peloponnesian War, I'm, I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to stay here and pretend I like what's going on. I'm going to declare a personal truce. With, I'm going to, to negotiate a personal peace with the Spartans. And he negotiates... <laughs> just on the basis, the one general, he's like, I'm just going to set up a personal No, no like ju course. just this one person, just the protagonist. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's like a, a, a rural uh, farmer, it's like, you know what? I'm going to negotiate a personal peace with the Spartans. And he, according to the comedy, he manages that. And, and then he's the only Athenian who is um, allowed in this way to trade and get access to a specific kind of um, fish, 
which was a delicacy in ancient Athens. And there's like this, this uh, Athenian general, Lamacus, and he goes to him, he's like, oh, give me your fish. I'm like, no, but I'm a general. I don't care. I'm eating my fish as we speak. And then he sends like different people to ask for the fish, and it ki- right. kind of gets absurd. But uh, it, like uh, what Aristophanes does, and there is another, let's say, comedy where Nicias appears in, of course, not favorable terms. It's kind of like Nicias and uh, Nicias and Demosthenes. They appear in the night as these people who just suck up to the people. They are like these slaves of the people. And they just need to, they, they just have to follow all these trends or, or else they won't get, uh, they won't maintain their power. I think we call that um, our American political system is pretty much how that works. They have to follow the people. They have to do whatever the people, I mean, they do whatever the people want. I mean, they make lots of money on their own, but that's effectively, I think there's a feeling that the tail wags the dog, that the, the whole thing gets run by. The back end. It, it, it's a gross generalization, but when I was uh, reading the storylines of these uh, uh, Athenian uh, politicians, I was thinking about the United States myself. I can see some. Well, that made me leave me my very last question. So yeah. I am the whole reason I read these things. I've always been fascinated by the ancient world. And I think the Greeks and Romans are interesting. Uh, I think the Chinese and I study a bunch of read a bunch of old Eastern stuff, too. Uh I think this stuff is interesting, but most people don't go back and read these old things. If somebody came to you and said, okay, I'm not necessarily into history. I think you've sold me on the fact there's a good narrative. There's an interesting plot. There's fascinating conflicts in there. There's good stories that bubble up out of it. If somebody's like, I don't, am I going to get something out of this? A modern person walks up, should I read Thucydides? Do you have a thing? I don't know. How, how do you pitch it? How do you pitch Thucydides to somebody who's like, do I really want to read that? Well, the idea is that, uh, and I'm, I'm going to do this old trick with there are two kinds of people. Okay. There are two kinds of people. One kind of person, when they hear someone pounding four times, <laughs> they, they think that uh, their upstairs neighbor, like that he's an Amazon seller. And, right. and, and, and he's putting the box together. So in, in this way, they're like, their guesswork is insufficient. And there are people who go out and find out about things, about how, let's say, humans work, because all these things, like, it, 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 it's not, uh, um, let's say, it's a dynamic environment where people are moving and making choices. And of course, Thucydides is biased in his own right, but still uh, he uh, tries to give as fair an account as possible. And um, in, in this way, like one learns that actually the upstairs neighbor, like that kind of people, they, they go out there, they, they read this book, and okay, they don't necessarily learn that the upstairs neighbor is actually uh, cleaning the filter of his coffee machine. Right. But when they enter into this kind of relations with other people, they start understanding pe- how people tick better. And they also start understanding that uh, maybe in our today, we have a certain value system. We have certain things that we think are uh, a given and we have other things that we don't even think about. But if you look through this thinking of Thucydides as he's putting out this story for us, you start seeing that back then there were people who had a, a, a totally different way of capturing the world. And uh, just by putting ourselves in their shoes, we can see that um, where we have we take some given things as weaknesses. Maybe they weren't weaknesses for them, where they had certain things which were considered their weaknesses. We don't have these weaknesses now, and we become more informed about our view of the world. 
And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to use the word, it's a life-changing book. <laughs> okay. But <clears throat> as a, a famous psychoanalyst once said, if someone says it's not a life-changing book, it means it, it is a life-changing book. 